Welcome to Worship at Aldersgate Church. My name is Hannah Pratt Sledge and it's an honor to serve as one of the pastors here. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we would love to connect with you. We encourage you to go to our website, aldersgatechurch.net backslash worship. There are ways to fill out a connect card, to fill out an online prayer card so that we can be praying with and for you and to give online. Also, there's a way on through our worship page to sign up for our upcoming small group study. So, in the month of March, in preparation of for Lent leading up to Easter, we are doing an all church wide study on Adam Hamilton's study titled Simon Peter, Flawed but Faithful Disciple. So we are excited to journey together. There are in-person and online groups available. So if you go to that aldersgatechurch.net backslash worship page, you can click to sign up to be a part of a small group starting in March. Also, I just wanna thank you for your partnership with Aldersgate. When you give to Aldersgate, you allow us to offer this online ministry, to come to you in your living room, your car, wherever you're watching this. And we wanted to let you know that beginning on March 6th, we will be shifting the time of our online worship service. So we are going to be live streaming for the first time our 10 o'clock worship service beginning on March 6th. So instead of watching it at 9.30, we're gonna shift that back just slightly, but we will come to you live at 10 o'clock beginning March 6th. So I wanted to let you know about that very special announcement. As you know, we've been praying hashtag 517 as a church. We pray at 517 in the morning or 517 in the evening. And this month we are praying Micah 6, 8 to love to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. So let's take a moment to pray together. God, we thank you for the call that you've placed on our hearts to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. God, we pray that you would continue to lead and guide us as a church. God, we thank you for this church and the impact it has in the community and the world around us. God, we pray for all the ministries of this church. God, we pray that you would strengthen and guide each and every single one of us. In this moment, God, we ask that you would open our hearts and ears and minds, that we would hear and be able to receive from you. It's in your name we pray, amen. What comes to mind for you when I say the word evangelism? Maybe you think about Billy Graham speaking to the masses, or maybe you think about a street evangelist or a televangelist. Maybe you think about a track that somebody gave you or you gave to somebody else. Maybe you think about the Romans road. There are all sorts of things that may come to mind when I say the word evangelism. Yet if we're being honest, many of us get nervous by the word evangelism. It might even make you sweat just to hear me name it. And we get uncomfortable with that word because it makes us nervous and we start getting anxious because we're not trained apologists or we're not tr trained theologians. And if evangelism is simply bragging to others about God, well, we get nervous because we don't always know what to say. And can I just have a moment of honest confession with you right now? Uh, sometimes I also get nervous about the word evangelism. I am a trained theologian. I went to school to talk about God, but even I sometimes get nervous about the word evangelism. In this moment of uh, true confession, I'll let you know uh, that sometimes in my life, it's been really awkward uh, to be in new situations and meet new people. And they ask that famous American question of, what do you do for a living? And so when they ask me, what do I do for a living? And I respond, I'm a pastor. You can imagine some of the weird looks or questions that I sometimes get. And I'll be honest in this moment of confession with you. One time, my husband, who is also a pastor, when we were on vacation, we decided that we were tired of answering the question of what do you do for a living and saying we're pastors and get all the strange looks and questions. And so we decided that if we were asked that question, we would say we were executive directors of a nonprofit. Yeah, that is slightly true, just bending the truth a little bit. And thankfully, miraculously, maybe nobody asked us on that trip, so we didn't have to bend the truth. But I get it, it can be scary to talk about evangelism. But I think it's important for this sermon series that we're in right now titled On Mission. Over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about how we are called, commissioned by Jesus to make disciples for the transformation of the world and that we do that rooted in love. That discipleship is essential to this mission that God calls us to. But if you think about it, discipleship and evangelism are two sides of the same 
coin. They are both essential to living on mission for Jesus. Evangelism is simply sharing the good news about the work God has done and is doing in the world. And it's inviting people to perhaps come to know and follow Jesus for the very first time. And then they enter into a relationship of deepening their relationship with Jesus, a process we call discipleship. Yet the end goal of discipleship is for us as mature believers and followers of Jesus to evangelize others, to share the good news with others. So there's this cyclical relationship between evangelism and discipleship that they are two sides of the same coin. They are deeply connected and related. And so we have to talk about both of them when we talk about living on mission today. And so to maybe help you and me not be so anxious or scared when we hear the word evangelism, what if we reframed it a little bit? And what if I said that evangelism is simply sharing your story? What if evangelism is simply sharing our stories of faith, the difference that God has made in our lives? Would that maybe be a little less scary to you and me when we talk about evangelism? If you think about evangelism, really that's what it's been for thousands of years, just people st sharing their stories about the difference Jesus has made in their lives. So we're going to look at one particular story today in John chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles or a Bible app with you, we're going to be in John uh, chapter 4 and we're going to begin reading in verse 27. But I want to give you a little context uh, to this story of how we get to this significant story in the Gospel of John. So Jesus is going through Samaria and he's tired on his journey. And so he sits down at a well and it's noon in the middle of the day. And a woman comes to the well in the middle of the day. And this is odd because people didn't normally come to draw water in the heat of the day. But Jesus is seated there and he asks this woman for a drink. Now, this is revolutionary on two levels. One, Jews and Samaritans, Jesus a Jew and the woman a Samaritan, they did not speak to one another. And Jesus on the second level is a Jewish rabbi, a teacher, and Jewish rabbis do not speak to women. So he crosses two boundaries to have a conversation with this woman at the well. And they enter into this theological conversation where it becomes clear that Jesus knows a lot about this woman. He knows all about her relational drama and struggles. He knows that she's had five different husbands and the man that she now lives with is not her husband. And at the end of their conversation, Jesus reveals that he is the Messiah, the very savior of the world. And this encounter with Jesus forever changes this woman's life. And she runs off to tell anyone who will listen her story of encountering Jesus. And that's where I wanna pick up in verse 26. Verse 27 says this, just when his disciples came back, they were out in the city getting food. So when they returned to the well, they were astonished that Jesus was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. This woman leaves her water jar at the well and runs off to tell her story. That tells us two things. One, she was in a hurry to go tell her story to anyone who would listen. And two, she planned to come back to tell Jesus how it went when she shared her story. And so she dashes off to tell her story of her encounter with Jesus and invites people to come and see Jesus for themselves, that they might experience the same transformation in encountering Jesus for themselves. And so meanwhile, while she's out telling her story, Jesus and his disciples are seated by the well and they're having their own conversation. And they, jump forward in the conversation. Let's pick up in verse 35. Jesus said, do you not say four months more and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one so sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. The region that Jesus is in is famous for growing corn. And so Jesus is looking at the fields of corn around him. He's talking about the harvest. He's quoting an agricultural proverb that where if you plant seed and wait four months, then you can reap the harvest. But the harvest that Jesus is talking about is instant. 
and it's quick and it's happening as they sit there having this conversation. In fact, if you were to sit at the well where Jesus and his disciples were and to look down in the city where the women went to share her story, you could see people coming out of the city, flocking up the hill to see Jesus dressed in their white robes. And so some versions of this passage say the fields are white unto harvest as the people in their white robes were coming up to encounter Jesus, perhaps for the very first time. And so the people come to Jesus, and this is how the story ends in verse 39. Many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony, because he had told me everything I had ever done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Many people come to believe in Jesus because the woman shared her story. So if you don't hear anything else today, I want you to hear this. Your faith story matters. The difference that God has made in your life matters because when you share your story, other people are invited to come to believe in Jesus. Other people are invited to experience the transformational power of God in their lives. People came to Jesus in the woman's story because they could see the transformation in her life. They knew her reputation and how it was restored. They had relationships with her and came to know Jesus for themselves, all because she shared her story with the people of the city that where she was from. You and I are called to share our stories as well. But if we think about it, there are a couple obstacles to sharing our stories. The first is we don't always know our stories of faith. You and I, we live in a very busy culture where we have emails and texts and tweets and have to run and pick up the kids from soccer and dance and get everything ready for the next day and the next day. And we're just so busy that we don't always take time to slow down to reflect on our stories, to reflect on where is God working in our life. This is why practices like journaling or devotions or even keeping a gratitude journal are so important because it forces us to slow down, to be aware of God's presence in our life, to see the work that God is doing so that we have stories to share with others. I'll give an example from my own life. Many of you know I love to run. And so a couple weeks ago I was running and I all of a sudden had this sense of God's presence trying to reveal something to me, but I had a choice in that moment. I could keep running and just ignore it, or I could stop and slow down and be aware to what God was trying to teach me in that moment. We have to be willing to slow down, to be present, to see where God is at work in our lives. The second obstacle for many of us is that we're afraid to tell our stories. We may know our stories of faith, the difference God has made in our life, but we're afraid to talk about it. We feel that this evangelism word is so scary because we have these ideas of negativity or loud or manipulation in our mind, but evangelism is none of those things. Evangelism is really based on love and nurturing and care. It's wanting to share our stories with others so that they can experience the transformational love of God in their life. Sometimes we are afraid because our stories feel personal or we think people might think we're foolish or that we're off our rocker in some way. But we have to develop a courage, a boldness, to be willing to share our stories with other people out of love. The third obstacle that we may face is that we might not have others to share our stories with. Now, let me first say, it is very important for us to share our faith stories with other Christians. It's a way we can encourage each other and grow and deepen in our discipleship and our relationship with Jesus. A couple weeks ago, I had a privilege to have lunch with two other ladies from church, and we were sharing stories of how God has worked in our lives and in the life of our children, and our hearts were on fire in that time together. We were inspired to live out our faith in powerful ways that week from that time together. It's important to share our stories with other Christians, but it's also important to share our stories with people who don't yet know Jesus, who, who are not connected to a church family. Studies show us that the longer we are a Christian, the less and less friends we have outside the church. But studies also show us that most people come to know Jesus through a personal acquaintance, through a spouse, through a friend, through a family member. 
your unique circle of influence and acquaintance is specific to you. Nobody else has the same network of connections that you do. And you are called to share your story with those people out of love, seeking transformation that they can encounter Jesus in their lives. So friends, what if evangelism isn't quite as scary as we think? Could we reframe that word, reclaim it by saying that evangelism is simply sharing our stories? 1 Peter 3.15 says to always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. So this week, I encourage you to think about what are your stories? Where has God been at work in your life? When did God provide something that you desperately needed at just the right time? When did God connect you with somebody who changed your life? When did God answer a prayer or work healing in your life? Where is God at work? Where has God been at work? And where is God in your life at work in your life right now? And then may we all have the courage to share our stories and be intentional about the relationships that we have, that when the time and moment is right, that we can share about the difference God has made in our lives. Let us do that as we continue to live on mission together. Now, as I share that with you, you don't just have to take my word for it. This past week, I had the opportunity to talk with my friend Sam, and Sam is an incredible evangelist as he shares what God is doing in his life and has been inviting friends to be a part of church here at Aldersgate. And so I want you to take a moment to watch this video to see how Sam is living as an evangelist in the world and the difference that it's making. Take a look. Well, Sam, thanks so much for being willing to have a conversation with me today. And uh, Sam, I had the privilege a couple months ago, back in November, to baptize you at Aldersgate. And I'd just love for you to share your story with me of what led you to make the decision to be baptized. Yeah, yeah. So um, the decision was basically God's ditches, ditches, decision. Mm -hmm. And he told me something where it when you go into God's family you have that many people to look out for you when you go, when you are in trouble or or need help and God's family is f being filled with more and more people each day wow. That's, that's beautiful, Sam. And so for you, why did you decide that you wanted to make it known that you were a part of God's family? The decision f for me is because when you're not part of God's family, it kind of feels like one part of your inside is empty. Mm -hmm. Be and when you're part of the God's family, that piece that was empty kind of went back in and is part of you now. Wow, wow. <clears throat> and Sam, I have heard that you've invited your friend uh, Landon to come to Kids of Aldersgate with you. So I'd love for you to share a story of how you invited Landon. So me and him, we have a great bond of friendship. And he's just a good kid. We go to the same school, may not be in the sa same grade, but it, we're in the same hall. We've, we've we sit very close together on the bus. We can talk to one e each another, and we're we're both not afraid to tell each other our problems and ask for help. Wow! And why did you decide to invite Landon to Kids of Aldersgate? The decision was basically God's decision because He told me that of inviting a friend is always a good thing mm -hmm. especially if it's not at in if, especially if it's to church and when kids of all to get, gets a new friend they always we are always happy and god and jesus want new kids to join the kids of all to get, all to get family and church family. Wow, thank you for inviting uh, Landon, Sam. I really appreciate that. And what would you say is the best thing about Kids of Aldersgate? What would you say? The best thing is God's, God's church. Mm -hmm. Everything that he has created 
I would say the best thing is the, pr the privilege to connect with God. Wow. And what does it look like for you to connect with God? Just praying and asking Him for help when I need it. Mm, that is really important, Sam. That's really good. Sam, if you could share one thing about God that you'd want everybody to know, what would that be? Bravery. Mm, mm. And how is God brave? Because when he went on the cross, he, I felt like I feel like he was at an age and he at he should have never died. But when he went on the cross, he sacrificed his life so we can have a better world. Mm, you're so right, Sam. Well, I think we should sign you up to preach. That was good stuff right there. So we're going to share our conversation in uh, church in front of all the adults. And so if sometimes adults struggle to invite their friends to church or to share their stories. So if you could give a piece of wisdom to the adults to encourage them to share their stories or invite their friends, what would you want to say to them? I would want to say to them, if you invite someone new to Kids of Aldergate, Gate, the Kids of Aldergate Gates and everybody appreciates it, especially Jesus and God, because when you invite that someone to Kids of Aldergate, Gate, that's just one more kid or person of family to kids of Aldersgate. Yeah, so you're just expanding the Aldersgate church family and really God's family, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Sam, thank you for the work that you're doing to invite others. Do you have friends? Do you have plans to invite more friends in the future? Yes, in the near future. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Sam, is there anything else you want to share with everyone listening today? One more thing. At God always has your back mm -hmm. wherever you go. Mm -hmm. That God's always with you. Yeah. Sam, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story with me. Thank you for inviting Landon. And thank you for being such an important part of the Kids of Aldersgate. We're really grateful for you. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I want to thank you, Sam, for sharing your story with us and your wisdom and your encouragement. And I hope it inspires us to share our stories this week as well. Many of you are aware that last week we received news of our new appointed pastor. Pastor Reverend Jen Williams will begin serving as the lead pastor at Aldersgate July 1st, 2022. And so I wanted to take a moment right now to read to you some more about Pastor Jen so that you can have a sense of who Jen is and that we can be praying for Jen and her family, for us as Aldersgate Church, as we prepare to welcome Jen and her family this summer. Pastor Jen's talents and experience and interpersonal skills have uniquely prepared her to lead Aldersgate in the coming years. She's a native of central Pennsylvania, received her BA from Temple University and her Masters of Divinity from Duke University in North Carolina. After graduating from Duke, she returned to Pennsylvania and has spent the last 20 years serving appointments in the Susquehanna Conference of the United Methodist Church, which included five years as an adjunct professor at Lancaster County's Theological Seminary. Her most recent appointment has been to Fishburn UM in Hershey, PA. Beyond her professional qualifications, Pastor Jen wanted to let us know some things about her on a personal level. She's married to her husband, Warren, of over 20 years, and they have an 11-year-old daughter, Thea. Pastor Jen is a big Duke basketball fan, but doesn't watch many games because they tend to lose when she watches. She loves zombie movies, TV shows, pretty much anything with a zombie in it. Last summer, she discovered Roots County Market in an auction in Mannheim and found that she loves canning her own food and learning to eat in her own words, weird things. Pastor Jen will officially begin and be appointed to Aldersgate on July 1st. In the meantime, our council and staff will continue to work with her to make the transition process as smoothly as smooth as possible. There is still some unknowns and uncertainty for us as our council continues to work with our district superintendent, Barry Robinson, to flesh out ideas about also having an associate appointed pastor. We ask you to stay tuned in the next coming weeks for more information on a possible appointment of an associate pastor. So I wanted to share that update with you this week in case any of you had not heard that. So I would love to close this time together in praying for Pastor Jen and for our church in this season of transition. Let's pray. 
God, we have been praying for you to continue to go before us. So God, we pray that you would continue to lead and guide and direct this church. God, we believe that you have good plans in store for us as a church. And so God, we are trusting in your will to be done and we surrender to your guidance and leadership. And so God, in this moment, we pray for Pastor Jen. We pray for her family. We pray for Fishburne, who is grieving the loss of their lead pastor in this transition. God, we pray for a smooth transition, for all the details to work out. And God, we pray for this church as we navigate this transition and as we walk alongside Pastor Jen and her family and one another. So God, we pray for peace, for love, for welcome. And God, we pray for goodness, for joy, for hope. And God, most of all, for your love to continue to lead and guide us and to be experienced by all. So God, thank you for Pastor Jen and for her family. And God, we thank you for Aldersgate Church and how you've brought us together. In your name we pray, amen. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along. Is the God of the Valley. 